today we are going to recap and wrap up our uh, series, Everyday Theology. So if you haven't been here or you forgot about the message uh, or the message series because uh, last week we did something special for Mother's Day, never uh, fear <laughs> because we're going to recap. And so uh, through these messages, we have considered uh, the rhythms and ordinary liturgies of life that connect us to God. We have done our very best to learn, uh, to be attentive to the, the, the regular routines and the tangible realities of our existence, including our weaknesses and our needs, and how that helps reveal sacredness in our daily life that connects us to Jesus. So hopefully we have created some practical touch points within our everyday life practices that can help us to intentionally uh, meet with God and see his presence all throughout our life. Because sometimes we compartmentalize things and we spend time with God while we're here on Sundays or if we're at home specifically doing a devotion or if we're doing some other godly or churchy thing, and then the rest of our life, we kind of just live our life, right? Well, that's what we're trying to get away from. And so we kicked off things a few weeks ago by talking about two everyday things that occur in all of our lives that have the potential to be those touch points that we are trying to look at. Uh, we read 1 John 1, 5 through chapter 2, verse 1, and we discussed how at the end of every single day, we can be met with God's grace and hope as we grow in Christ if... We intentionally make our bedtime routine something that reminds us that whatever the day has held, whatever we've gone through, God's presence can tuck us in. It is an opportunity so that we can lay down, literally, and breathe deep, relax, thank God for all the good things that have happened during that day, but also to put the bad things in his hands and confess any sins or shortcomings that that day had held. And then if we do that, how much more restful will our rest be? If we have thanked God for the good things, we've given him the bad things, we've confessed and, and lifted the burden of sin and shortcomings, then we can truly relax and truly get rest in him. Uh, we also read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 and discussed how just as Paul prayed for God to strengthen the believers at the church at Ephesus, we can make our morning routine a tangible way to pause and invite God to strengthen us for the day ahead. And so the night before you take care of business, you spend a holy moment with God and you get rested. And then in the morning, it's time for the new day. You get up and then you pause and then you invite God to strengthen you for the day ahead, whatever that day might be. Because how many of you guys know that when you take your head off that pillow, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> it might be the best day you've ever had, and it might be the worst. But if you ask God for strength and you start off your day by pausing and having that holy moment with him, then your day is going to go better than it would have if you wouldn't have done that. Then on week two, we read Colossians 3, 1 through 17, and we looked at the different ways that as believers, Christ is with us, transforming us. It's a process. It's ongoing. And he's empowering us to live our everyday moments in the light of eternity. And he does that even at work. Now, how many of you guys know that work is called work because it's work? And when you say it, you usually scrunch your face a little bit because it's like, Ugh, that word work, right? But work is an opportunity. It is an opportunity for us to be on mission with God. God has plans and purposes, and it doesn't stop for the 8 to 12 hours that you're working. And so we need to do our best to say, God, what do you have planned today? Because I want to be a part of what you're doing, even at work. <laughs> so now here we are at week three. 
And today we're going to take a look at Romans 8, 18 through 31, which is a pretty good chunk. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read it in its entirety. I'm going to read it slow. One, so that I don't mess it up. And two, so that we can really think about what we're hearing. How many of you guys know that it's great to hear God's word? All right, so let's go. Here we go. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the uh, present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is not seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be uh, conformed in the image of his son, and uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified." What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's good, right? It's also a lot. (laughs) But we're going to break it down a bit. And so uh, first and foremost, the main idea Paul is expressing to the church in Rome is this. When the here and now seems lackluster... We must remember the hope of the future as well as God's purposes for today. A little more specifically, he's saying this. He's saying, when our bodies are tired and we wonder what we offer this world, God reminds us that we are loved and called by him to live out his purposes until our full redemption. Now, in our lives, there are many different stages. I read a statistic yesterday that was kind of surprising. It said that the average church in the United States has 75 people on a Sunday morning, and the median age is 75. Now, our church is a little more diverse, and we have a a lot more age uh, stages uh, represented, and that's good. That's a good sign of health. And uh, so hopefully um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, as you get into those later stages. You know, I started uh, youth ministry way back in the day when I was still in in Bible college the first time around. And uh, I was only 20 or 21 years old. And uh, here I am kind of still doing ministry. And so I feel like, oh, some years have passed. I'm probably what, in my late 20s, early 30s? But that's not true. <laughs> In August, I will be 45 years old. And so it's, it's, it's you know, mind-boggling that I am at this new stage of my life where I'm middle-aged, <laughs> um, hopefully. <laughs> and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because even if our median age is much lower than the national average, 
there's still quite a few of us that are getting older. And there are people that are either retired or approaching retirement or at a stage in your life where you're an empty nester. You know, you have a little more time to, to deal with, to, to do uh, what, what you want, <laughs> which is a, a novel concept. You know, when you're young and you have kids running around, you really don't have any time to do anything you want. And so that's what we're going to talk about. When we're young, life is exciting. Things are ever changing. There is something new around every corner. The iconic act uh, uh, actress Betty Davis is attributed to saying this. Old age um, ain't no place for sissies. <laughs> and uh, that's because growing older is a gift that not everyone has the privilege of, re of receiving, but it doesn't mean that it's a piece of cake. With these new freedoms and this new uh, time, there's also new challenges. I say the same thing about raising kids. You know, everyone always talks about, oh, when you have babies, you have diapers and you have formula and you have car seats and you have strollers. And I say, yeah, but when you have teenagers, you have cars and iPads. And it's just new challenges and uh, new benefits. And every stage has that. And, and life is the same way. You know, we get to these different stages where we might have more time in this area, but we have less money or, or vice versa. And so we want to talk about that a little bit uh, today, how our earthly bodies grow weary and tired. I've noticed in my life that uh, I'm much more tired than I used to be. I used to go to bed every night at about 2 a.m. and I would get up at about 8 a.m. every day and I was rearing to go. And uh, not so much anymore. I'm falling asleep at nine and <laughs> getting up at nine. <laughs> um, and so that's just a fact of life. When it comes to retirement, re retirement and all its promises of rest and relaxation uh, are only half true because now you're too tired to do what you thought you wanted to do uh, for some. Some people, retirement means boredom. They have all this time, but they don't have the things to do that they used to have. And so their checklist is have coffee in the morning. <laughs> and so when they get up at 430, like my dad, <laughs> and has his coffee, then he has a long time to go that day and, and nothing on the to-do list. And so if you had children, it's likely that when you were busy raising your family, uh, you didn't have time for boredom or for loneliness. But now in these golden years, uh, perhaps they're not as golden or shimmery and shiny as you thought they might be. Instead, it's this weird, troubling transitional time. Well, thankfully, God's vision for humanity and aging is one of hope and not of despair. God's presence and purposes are not reserved only for the young. You know, the young might have more energy, but they also have other things they have to do, like school and learning how life works. And so they have big uh, swaths of their time that are, that are taken. And so these are the, the trade-offs that uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today. In the verses that we just read, uh, there's a verse right before that, Romans 8, uh, 17. It says, now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are heirs with Christ and we will share in both his sufferings and his glory. You know, I've mentioned this many times in, in many contexts, but life is not always just fluffy clouds and, and, you know, we go through stuff and that's just a reality, but we all get to experience those sufferings and we'll get to experience the glory as well. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, he, he says, is this going to be worth it? And he answers that in Romans 8.18, uh, where we read and, and where he writes, uh, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. He said it's not even comparable. The glory is going to so much outweigh the sufferings. Don't worry about it. Paul says glory is coming. 
But at the present, we, just like creation, will experience this longing, this uneasiness for a time when all is eventually redeemed and pain is no more. Because that is going to be glorious. Amen? Amen? Well, as we read in Romans 8, 19, uh, as we read just a minute ago, uh, Romans 8, 19 through 23, Paul writes, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Uh, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. We are groaning and longing for this glory. We are ha experiencing this suffering just like the earth. Because how many of you guys know, we've mentioned this uh, a million times as well, that we live in an, uh, on the earth that is bent and broken. There's all kinds of crazy things that happen. There's, there's darkness and disease and death. And the world is groaning to be redeemed. How many of you guys know that Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? And we are going to be fully redeemed and fully glorified, just like the new heaven and new earth. We are going to be made completely new. So pastor and theologian Tim Keller writes this. There is a relentless pain that comes from, uh, f from first to last as things decay. As life is born in childbirth and life is lost in death, there is pain and misery. In this creation, no experience is untainted by pain, even if it is only the pain of knowing that experience cannot last. But none of this is the last word. Instead of frustration, there will be fulfillment. Instead of decay, there will be strength and newness. Instead of pain, there will be only joy. That is the blessed hope. In Romans 8.25, we read this, But if we hope, but if we hope with patience, even when we are acutely aware of all of the weaknesses, all of the suffering, both spiritually and physically, our bodies are not disposable or useless, even in our weakness. You know, you might be afflicted by some kind of suffering or some kind of weakness when it comes to you physically. Or maybe you're just chronically tired because you've lived a long, uh, great life and now your body just doesn't do what you want it to do all the time. That doesn't matter because even in our weakness, we can still fulfill God's purposes. We can still fulfill God's plan. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says of these verses, God has promised that a believer's body will finally be delivered from sin and its effects by the work of his son. Those who respond by faith to that promise have hope, a confident expectation of that bodily redemption. So we can grab onto the hope that someday everything will be made perfect. But in the meantime, we have what we have and we do our best with what we have to work with. Uh, they also point out that Paul tells the church in Galatia in Galatians 5.5 5, that for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Because how many of you guys know that some days you're just not feeling it? Some days you wake up and your back doesn't work and your knees don't work and you're like, what am I supposed to do? But it says through the Spirit... We eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Then in reference to Romans 8, uh, 23, it reads this. It says, uh, not only so, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. 
Uh, then the commentary uh, points this out. It, it, it states that the redemption of the body obviously has not occurred. You know that. When the, the storm front's rolling in and, you're, and your knee locks up, <laughs> you know that you have not been redeemed in your physical body yet. But it, it goes on to say this. Who hopes for what you've already, what, what you already had? If it, was, if it wasn't something that we were waiting for, then we wouldn't have to hope for it, right? But we eagerly anticipate it. The original Greek word used here for wait is apekodekomai. That's perfect Greek, by the way. I wrote it out phon phonetically, and I know that I butchered it, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's apekodekomai. Does that sound better? It sounds kind of Japanese, not Greek. <laughs> Whatever, the point is this. <laughs> in the original text, it has a, con a connotation of with steadfast endurance. That's the type of waiting that we're supposed to, to have. We're waiting for this glorious thing with a steadfast endurance. That means looking forward to that redemption, looking forward to that glorification of our physical body, that gives us the strength and the hope and the endurance while we wait. And so it's not just some pipe dream that we, that we think about, oh, in the future, everything will be great. It's something that, that helps us now as we look forward to that hope. It gives us steadfast endurance. Um, so in the context of Romans 8.18, 8, where Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This waiting, this longing, this steadfast endurance is in and during our present sufferings. So that should give us the hope to get up one more day. That should give us the hope to, to plunge ahead. <laughs> to keep on keeping on. So it is inevitable that we're going to suffer. Yay! <laughs> Great news, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be encouraging by pointing out that we're going to suffer, and probably more and more so as we get older. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. Well, not really, because we aren't left to our own devices to merely figure it out. God doesn't say, well, you're on your own, just trudge along and someday I'll fix all this. Instead, the Spirit joins in our struggle and He intercedes for us. He intercedes for our strength so that we can persevere. All of it is redeemable and all of it can be purposeful as we grow deeper with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is right there with us saying, I know it hurts. <laughs> I know you're tired, but we got this. I am here giving you the strength to, to, to push on towards that blessed hope, towards that glorification. Uh, we read in Romans uh, 8, 26 through 30, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had that aching and that burden and you went to pray and no words came out? Just a bunch of snot and noises that you hoped no one else heard because <laughs> they were weird? That's how it is sometimes. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit. Who's, who's the person that seeks our, or searches our minds? It's God, right? Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with His will. Who better to intercede for us than the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God and knows God's will and is going to pray God's perfect will for us. So it's even better to let Him take care of it. <laughs> and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. It doesn't say that God makes everything good. It says that 
in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You see, God is for us always, all the time so that we can face what lies ahead, even as we age, even as we have a whole new set of struggles, as we have a whole new uh, set of problems to figure out. You know, when you turn 45, you've never been 45 before. (laughs) When you turn 55, you've never been 55 before. So all the things that you figured out about being 30 and 40, they're not going to (laughs) help. Some of those principles, some of those truths, some of those experiences will help. But the truth of the matter is every single step forward we take is into uncharted territory. We just need to remember that there are universal truths, God's truths. What did Paul say in Romans 8, 31? He said, what then shall we say in response to these things? All these things we read, all these things we considered, all these things that he was teaching. What shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is true when we're 16, This is true when we're 26, 36, 46, 56. I know some of you, I'm getting close to yours. 66, 76, 86, 96, 106. All of us fall somewhere in there. Wherever you are on that list, this is true of you. If God is for us, who can be against us? Author Ann Colby writes this. She's not a Christian writer or a theologian or anything. Uh, Speaking of age specifically, she says, At the heart of ageism is the assumption that because of incapacity or low motivation, older adults contribute little to the world. That's not good, right? A view of aging that highlights decline offset by the dubious uh, rewards of self-indulgence and freedom from responsibility reinforces that uh, that ageist assumption. This uninspiring vision underestimates most older adults. How many of you know that many people underestimate the potential of older adults? Especially younger people, right? (laughs) But that's not true. Listen, age does not disqualify you from purposefulness. And retirement doesn't mean just biding your time until heaven. I often poke fun, uh, p- poke fun of this, but, you know, too many Christians feel that way. They think, well, I struggled all when I was young and I raised my kids and now I'm just going to kick back. Well, that's not good. <laughs> you can't just hold on. And wait, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. And there's a lot of stuff that only you can do. You are here for a reason. You are still called according to his purpose. Now, it is true that very few of us that make it to our our later decades of life uh, without having to take, you know, a regimen of vitamins or medications... How many of you guys are taking a lot of uh, supplements or vitamins or or pills these days? Hopefully not too many. But but listen, (laughs) while these pills are a sign that maybe you need more of a certain vitamin or a certain whatever, it it might be sort of a sign of weakness. It's also a sign that you've been faithful for years, that you've struggled for years, and that you're wanting to continue. So keep on keeping on. 
even if this body is getting tired, even if this body needs extra vitamin D or vitamin C or <laughs> vitamin E or whichever one. You know, take those vitamins and let's get to work. We must pause to thank God for getting us this far and ask him what work we can join with him moving forward. Instead of wrinkles, crow's feet or, or whatever, instead of gray hair that might be coming into your beard being a sign of, of someone who is just getting old, maybe these things should be signs of someone who's experienced life and has something to offer. Maybe it's a sign of accumulated wisdom. Maybe it's a sign of experienced love. Maybe it's a sign of sorrow. Maybe it's a sign that you have something to share. Because you do. You're a gift. And you need to share it with others in your community, in your family, in your church. The people right here need to hear what you've gone through, what you've learned. And someday, we'll all get to go home, we'll all get the full glorification, the full redemption. But that's not today. In closing the, this message out and this series out, I just want to recap one more time and remind us all that at the end of every single day, we can be met with God's grace and hope as we continue to grow in Christ if we intentionally make our bedtime routine something that reminds us that whatever the day held, no matter how rocky things got, we can truly rest in his presence. I want to remind us that we have an opportunity to, to breathe deep, to relax, to thank God for the good things, to put the bad things in his hand, to confess our sins and our shortcomings and get that true rest. And just like the Apostle Paul prayed for strength for the church at Ephesus, if we make our morning routine us praying for that same strength from that same God, because that's what it is, right? When the Apostle Paul prayed for God's strength for the people at Ephesus, he was praying to the same God we pray to. And he was praying for strength that they could endure the persecutions and the struggles and the things that they were dealing with. Why don't we do that? Why don't we open our eyes and before we jump out of bed and start scrolling on social media, why don't we say, God, I'm ready for today, but I can only do it with you. I pray for that same strength that Paul prayed for, for the church at Ephesus. Give me the strength I need to, to, to pull forward and to keep on keeping on. Let's do it, right? And then finally, work. Don't waste that eight hours, that 10 hours, that 12 hours, just going through the motions, turning the page, <laughs> whatever your job is. God has a purpose and you're a part of it. Ask God, what do you have planned today and how can I help? And then finally, uh, Today's idea that we're trying to grab a hold of is when the here and now seems a little lackluster, <laughs> we must remember the hope for the future as well as God's purposes for today. And even when our bodies are tired and we wonder what we have to offer, let God remind us that we are loved and we are called by him to live out his purpose until the full redemption. Each and every day matters. Each and every day is chocked full of opportunities to live out our calling, to live in God's purpose and presence. Let's do it. You guys with me?